Welcome back everybody. Today we talk about names and languages spoken by God and people of ancient times. So we know the Bible was written in ancient foreign languages like Hebrew, Latin and Greek or Koine Greek. And the language that Jesus and his disciples spoke was Aramaic. Aramaic is the oldest spoken and written language in the Middle East. And it is even older than Hebrew and Arabic. Probably one of the oldest written languages in the world today. It was the common language of Judea in the first century after the death of Christ. And most likely a Galilean dialect different from that of Jerusalem. Most Aramaic speakers were mainly located in the Near East about 3,000 years ago. Arabic speakers of all Abrahamic faith, including Jews, use the word Allah, that means God. Christian Arabs today have no other word for God except Allah. The Aramaic word for God for Assyrian Christians is Elaha or Allaha, and modern everyday Christians say God our Father. Well, let us just talk a little bit about Abba, the word Abba. What does Abba mean in Aramaic? This is an Aramaic word for Father, used by Jesus and also Paul to address God in a very close relationship of personal intimacy. So let us ask this question today. What is God's language? Well, God's language is a divine language, the language of the gods, or in monotheism, the language of God or angels is the concept of a mystical or divine proto-language which predates and supersedes human speech. This is like the Holy Ghost language. Let me just give you an example when I pray. Kendo masitianda rabando lo morebe ketianda ro kosondo lo motianda. Hallelujah! Raba kosende le ketianda. Karush kala handle mendele be ketianda. Raba kosondo lo monte le ketianda. This is a Holy Ghost language, and only God knows what I have just taught, told him, or spoken to him about. My spirit linked up with God's spirit and therefore he can understand what I'm praying about. All right, so the word Elohim is a singular of Eloha. This is the Hebrew name for the God of Israel in the Old Testament. And remember when referring to Yahweh, Elohim often is accompanied by an article of Ha to mean in combination the God. And sometimes with a further identification, Elohim Hayim, meaning the living God. So for some of you might remember that I have spoken a little bit about this in one of my previous videos, but I'm just adding on to that today. So please note God's name is Yahweh and not Jehovah. Yahweh, the God of the Israelites, look at the screen is his name which, which was revealed to Moses as four Hebrew consonants, Y-H-W-H. This is called the Tetragrammaton. Thus Yahweh became the artificial or substitute letter name Jehovah. God's real name from the Hebrew Bible is Yahweh, and it is one of the seven names of God in Judaism. Jehovah is therefore a modern mispronunciation of the Hebrew name Yahweh, which comes from the consonants of that name with the vowels of the word Adonai, which means Lord. And the Jews substituted this name for the proper name in reading scriptures. They did not want to mention his name Yahweh because they had fear of God. So Yah mean Ruach breath of God an existing being. This is what it means. Look also at the prophet Elijah. Eli is the opening words of Psalm 22, translated as my God, my God, and are the words Jesus called on the cross in Matthew 27 verse 46, which says the following. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, 
Eli, Eli, lemach sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing here heard this, they said, he is calling Elijah. So did you ever wonder why did they say that Jesus was calling Elijah? It was because of his name. Because Elijah means Eli is my God and Yah is the Ruach breath of God or an existing being. So the name Elijah is translated my God, the breath of life, the life giving spirit. Let us go now to 1 Corinthians 15 verse 45. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last man, Adam, that was Jesus, became a life-giving spirit. Now let me ask you another question. Why was Elijah the prophet who was taken up into heaven in 2 Kings 2 from verse 3 to 9 as it was with Enoch? See how the Bible is connected from people to people and from God to people and people to other people. All right, so the name Elijah also derived from the name Elisha, meaning my God is salvation. I find it so interesting that people said that Jesus was calling Elijah when he was hanging on the cross because of the name that means Yah, the Ruach breath of God. Right, now let us just talk quickly about Adam and Eve in Eden, in paradise. What language did they speak? All right, so did Adam and Eve also speak Aramaic in the garden of God, which was situated in a place called Eden? So traditional Jews such as Midrash, according to Genesis Rabbah 38, says that Adam spoke the Hebrew language because of the name that he gave Eve, which is Isha. Look at the book of Genesis 2 verse 23. And also the name Shava or Hava or Shaya. Look at these names on the screen and refer to Genesis 3 verse 20. This name only makes sense in Hebrew. Because Eve is a female name derived from a Latin Eva, which means to breathe. That is the name Shava or Hava. Or to live, to give life or to be living. So we can clearly see that this name Eve is important because to give life refers to a woman who gives birth as per God's creation of females. And the most essential reason for females on the earth is to give life as per God's instruction, fill the earth and multiply in Genesis 1 verse 28. So as we know, God gave Adam the knowledge and the wisdom to name every animal on the earth in their scientific names. Did you know that? Can you imagine for one minute how clever was Adam? He must have had most of the knowledge that God had himself for him to be able to mention or to name every animal in a scientific way. Well, I don't know scientific names of animals, but can you imagine that he had all these different names that he mentioned animals in that way? Where man is called Isha, as I said earlier, because she was taken from man. But these two words are not connected, actually. After the Garden of Eden, she was given a name Hawa, Eve, meaning living, as I mentioned just earlier. But there are some who believe that the root word of Eve comes from another word meaning snake. Though I cannot really agree with this statement, because the very names of Adam and Eve are symbolic of their roles. Adam comes from the Hebrew Adoma, meaning man, taken out of the red ground. And Eve is from the Hebrew for life. So the complete biblical story of Adam and Eve is found in Genesis 1 verse 26 to Genesis 5 verse 5. And there you can learn so much about these two people, who they were and about their character. But if you really want to learn much, much more about them, I would advise you to try and get hold of a book 
that is called the lost books of the Bible and the forgotten books of Eden. Now in that book, it is such an interesting book. In there, they talk about Adam and Eve in uh, paradise, in the garden, and what happened there until the fall after they met Satan and how Satan influenced Eve and how when God came and asked um, Eve, what did she do? She said the snake was the one who, who said it. And then uh, when God asked Adam, he said, the woman said I must do it. So everybody gave somebody else, you know, uh, said that it was their wrongdoings. And it is so funny for me today because many Christians do the same thing. When something happens, it's never them. It's always somebody else. Not just Christians, but other people too. We are so quick to say it wasn't me. It was that person. <laughs> but anyway. What I wanted to say is this, in that book, you can learn about things that happened in uh, the garden of uh, this place in Eden. I read there that there was a fruit that Adam and Eve ate that was so huge, they could eat a whole month on maybe one fig. And that is how big the fruit was. So imagine in your mind for a moment that there's a fig that is so big or an apple, not an apple or a banana or even um, uh, grapes hanging on a branch or whatever kind of fruit that they ate there in the garden. Imagine that they were so big that they could eat a whole month on that fruit. So maybe to you it sounds like it's not possible. But let me just say it is because if you go onto the internet today and you type in huge fruit in today's world, you'll find many pictures of massive fruit and vegetables that even today is still grown. So for me, it's possible because if it's here today, it could have been in the garden in paradise that was in a place called Eden. So for me, it's true. So when I read through this lost books of the Bible and uh, everything that happened in the Garden of Eden, I find many interesting things that are mentioned there. There's also um, talks between God and Adam and talks between Eve and God and talks between Adam and Eve that we do not find in the Bible but actually makes sense if you take the Bible and see what actually happened every time that something happened with them like when they ate the fruit and while I'm talking about the fruit can we just say it was not an apple I do not know why people always in the pictures or paintings refer or paint uh, to an apple because nowhere in the Bible does it say that it was an apple. I don't know who started this thing, but people, please read the Bible for what it says. God says it was a fruit. He does not say it was an apple. So we know it's not an apple. So don't tell people it was an apple. Nobody really knows what kind of fruit it was. It could have been a pomegranate, for all we know. It could have been a peach. It could have been a banana. So nobody really knows what kind of fruit it was. So let us just leave it there. When you talk to people and explain to them what happened in the Garden of God, which was situated in a place called Eden. You, you hear what I did there, right? It's not the Garden of Eden. It is the Garden of God situated in a place called Eden. So please let us say it as the Bible teaches us. So, but enough about the fruit and Adam and Eve and all that. So this is all I have for you on this very short teaching this week. And uh, next week we will really go into much, much more and very interesting stuff. And I trust that you will be blessed unto them. Remember that I'm praying for all of you. Remember that I love you in Christ and that we pray for each other. Keep us also in our prayer. Please pray for us that we get more subscribers that could listen and learn about this amazing word of God. So until then, may God bless you wherever you go and whatever you do. Whatever your hands find to do, may it be blessed in Jesus' mighty name. Shalom.